Good afternoon. My name's Kevin Clements, and I'm the director of the Toda Peace Institute based in Japan. And it gives me and my colleague Volker Berg a very great pleasure to welcome Katarina Tewa to this public conversation on climate change, cultural vulnerability, and social resilience. Katarina is an interdisciplinary scholar, artist, and award-winning teacher. She's of Banaban, Ikiribati, and African American heritage, and was born and raised in Fiji. She's Professor of Pacific Studies at ANU in the School of Culture, History and Language, College of Asia and the Pacific, and a Senior Fellow of the Higher Education Academy. In addition, she's a very prolific writer, dancer, artist, and award-winning teacher. So we're very pleased that she's giving us some of her precious time to talk about issues that are close to her heart and mind. Katerina, welcome. Thank you so much. Come to Maori and Nisambula Vinaka. Thank you, Ora. You're from Banaba. Can you tell us the story of Banaba and your place in it? Yes. Um, so as you mentioned earlier, I'm I'm of Banaban um, Tabitawen, which is Ikiribas and African American heritage. But I was born and raised in Fiji um, as part of a community that was displaced from what is now Kiribati to Fiji in 1945. Um, so my father's family is from Banaba, and Banaba is in the western um, edge of what is now Kiribati. But for 80 years, Banaba was mined for phosphate by Australia, Aotearoa, New Zealand, and the United Kingdom. So that phosphate mining devastated the landscape. Um, and after World War II, the whole population was moved to what is Rambi Island in the northern part of Fiji. So I grew up in Fiji knowing that we were part of this uh, displaced minority community, but not knowing so much about our history because it wasn't something we learned about in school or as part of any curriculum we picked up bits and pieces uh, from our families, from aunties and uncles and grandparents. Um, but I've basically spent most of my life now trying to understand our history and what happened and how we came to move from the Central Pacific um, to Fiji. So, yes, I'm I'm part of that community, and it's also part of my my research and broader work as well. So, so you started off life being dislocated in some way. Yes, exactly. I mean, you know, Fiji is a very multicultural place and there are, um, you know, many different communities speaking many languages and having different expressions of culture. But there are two larger groups, which are the Itake indigenous Fijians and, and Indo-Fijians. But um the other communities we didn't grow up understanding as dislocated, but ours was dislocated. And so that displacement was part of the narrative of growing up, and except nobody had all the details on how that displacement came about. There were just different narratives um, around phosphate mining and that move by the British from the Central Pacific to Fiji, but not a lot of details of what the mining actually did to the island, the way in which it made it quite uninhabitable, um, and the way that extraction impacted not just the landscape and the environment, but our culture, our language, our sense of identity, our, our land rights, protocols, genealogies, everything. Um, so often when they, you know, when people think about displaced community, communities, migrants, refugees, those sorts of things, they think more about um, people living in a new land or a new environment and whether it's a, a positive experience for them, but they don't often go into the details of where they've come from and the details of that impact on being um, uprooted from uh, a place that your people, your ancestors have lived for thousands of years, which was the case for Banaban. So when you're part of an indigenous displaced group, it can be quite a different experience from other communities who may have had ancestors that were already moved or already migrated over long periods of time. Um, Banabans, um, in many ways, 
thought of themselves as very much belonging to that island. They were part of that island. They belonged to the rock. The word Banaba means rock or the rock island. And that's what um, the mining companies were quite interested in because the entire rock island is made of very valuable phosphate. Um, but we were, you know, in our language, we were part of the, the landscape. We belonged to that land. So displacing the people and displacing, uprooting, digging up the land caused a double displacement, if you will, um, where both the land and the people were moved. So that caused all kinds of problems um, for Barnabans. And in many ways, over the last you know many decades, Barnabans have been trying to figure out who they are and how to rebuild and repair their culture in you know some very creative but also some very difficult and quite problematic ways as well and that's what mining does it it kind of breaks apart not just landscapes but it uh fractures people um and the bonds that they've had um from you know in our case for hundreds and hundreds of years so yeah that's that's what i've spent most of my life trying to understand is something like mining which is you know I mean it's everywhere all across the world and people think about it more as a as a something economic you know something that's part of development something that helps create goods and services that we need but they don't often think about the actual um, damage to lands and damage to cultures and peoples and places and everything from from language to sense of identity and so mining for me is not just a commercial or in this case colonial enterprise but something that needs to be understood as having an almost you know complete um impact on lives landscapes waterways peoples etc um, yeah, does not only have a physical impact on on the land, but beyond that, it has also these mental, psychological, spiritual impacts on exactly on people, as I understand it. And so, how then, now that you live in Canberra as an academic, how do you try to maintain then the connection to the land of your your ancestors? Yeah, so it's. That's quite interesting because most Banabans haven't had an opportunity actually to go to Banaba. Um, now, after the 80 years of mining was completed um, and Banaba was sort of left to decay by multiple governments, um, the many, many different shipping routes and transport um, services that used to exist to go to Banaba because it was such a economic hub, they no longer exist. So your average Banaban can't actually get to Banaba. But I was very fortunate, not just because I was, um, you know, had opportunities to do my PhD and further studies, but my father was the chairman of the Banaban Council of Leaders. Uh, for six years, he was um, elected into this role because he was one of the few Banabans who um, was a longtime civil servant in Fiji and had been head of um, agriculture and primary industries and many different um, departments and ministries in Fiji. He was also the first Banaban uh, to go to university. And so um, when he was quite close to retirement and thought he was going to retire, his people asked him if, you know, he would put up his hand to join um, the Rambi Council of Leaders, which is the Banaban Council of Leaders in Fiji. And he agreed and he was elected and he was elected chairman. So that was an opportunity for me to actually travel to Banaba because usually the chairman gets, is one of the few people along with um, the Banaban members of parliament. And there are two of those, one based in Kiribati and usually one one based in Fiji, but we haven't had um, that for quite some time under the Bainimarama government. Um, but my father was able to travel to Banaba, and so I asked him if I could go along with him and some members of the council. And so I actually was able to visit Banaba twice, which is 
two times more than most Bonobans uh, would have been able to. Um, and Bonobus sort of exists for most people in Fiji and the broader, uh, broader Bonoban diaspora as um, as an ancestral homeland, as a place that is our source of identity, is um, is absolutely critical, but is more in the imagination, the consciousness, the discourse than a place that people have actually been to or been able to go to. Um, there is a population of about 300 or so Bonobans there on, on Banaba, and they are caretakers, if you will, of, of the land, um, maintaining quite an important presence on the island because for Banabans, it's very important to have our people there. So um, my uncle, one of my father's younger brothers was one of the uh, Banabans who was taken there in the 1970s and stayed and remained and had children there. So when I was able to visit uh, Banaba as part of my um, PhD research, it was nice to go there and have family there and you know people we could connect to. But I got to walk all over the landscape and visit all the dilapidated old mining um, facilities and see all the different, the pinnacles and the rust and the debris and everything left behind by the mining company. And that was very impactful for me because it went from something that was just this idea, something that our communities would sing about and dance about and, and speak about in Fiji but being there in person on a landscape that used to be electrified and filled with all kinds of merriment and industry and all kinds of things, which was now quite silent and stark and almost like a post-apocalyptic um, scenario had, had this massive impact on me and ch changed the way I thought about things like development, progress, industry, all of those things that actually drive fossil fuel emissions and, and cause humans to overconsume on the planet. I could see very clearly the impact of industry, commerce, colonialism, extraction on just a six square kilometer landscape. And I think it's that size of that landscape that kind of causes it to have a more um, intense um, kind of impact on, on someone because you can see the ocean sort of from all sides. There's just, there's no other island within sight from Banaba. So it's sort of a rock in the middle, near the equator, kind of in the center of the earth um, with a vast blue planet um, surrounding it. And yet it's, damaged and it's decimated and it's not um, a lush Pacific Island, which, you know, somebody's idea of paradise, which is normally how people imagine the Pacific. It wasn't that at all. So the visual nature of the impact and the ways in which the mining left big holes in the earth holes where people used to live, where they used to have their homes and their houses and have their places of worship, their, um, you know, sacred sites where they used to bury their ancestors. Now that they these were all holes, this was something that had a major uh, a kind of physical, spiritual, emotional impact on me and changed the kind of research that I was doing, which was originally going to be about the political economy of pity, which is a word that you often hear Bonobans using, pity, pity for our history, pity for our land and pity for our displacement, pity for the loss of cultural identity. But I, I changed my whole entire um, PhD project after actually going to Banaba and learning a lot more about mining, a lot more about phosphate extraction and a lot more about these massive fertilizer and agricultural industries which absolutely fuel um you know climate change but cl the climate change discourse actually kind of invisibilizes the details of industrial impact you have to walk the devastated landscapes 
to really under, understand and deeply think about you know what we're doing to our planet and what we're doing to people and what what our consumption habits and needs are doing to cultures that were otherwise thriving or managing in very limited environments you know thinking about things like what kind of resilience have we lost from being able to live in challenging environments by devastating those sorts of landscapes all of these things were questions that I then started exploring after I was able to to visit Banaba um, when I was much younger. <laughs> um, yes, and it's shaped my research and my teaching um, ever since. Great. I mean, that's that's very fascinating. So that you 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 have a rock that's left, and you have holes in the ground that are left, um, but uh, but but you have um you know a dispersion of the culture a dispersion of the peoples dispersion of its history and so forth um so it's not just about sort of taking barnabas you know the land the phosphate the people but in the process things and people change and you've used this term of remixing for what happens in the process what what, what does that entail what what is remixing in your view yeah so it's Remix, I'm quite I quite like this term because it is it actually describes what happened to the land of Banaba because when it was dug up and crushed into, you know, ground up um into a form in which um big companies could extract phosphoric acid to then um help create superphosphate fertilizer, it basically meant the rock of Banaba became mixed in with other landscapes as that fertilizer was dispersed across mm -hmm. farms, many, many, many farms all across New Zealand and all across Australia. So in one sense, this concept of mixing or remixing is what actually happened to the rock of Banaba through that industrial process and through an industrial um, transformation um, and a commodity chain. Um, but also I found that it wasn't just the land that was extracted and remixed, but also our culture and our identity. And I found that um, similarity quite fascinating because when Banaba was dug up and holes were made in the land, simultaneously there was a colonial apparatus that was leaving big holes in our language, in our histories, in our cultures, and in our identities. So the parallel experiences between both the landscape and the culture or the people was, was uncanny and quite, um, I mean, it was sad, but it was also disturbing and interesting for me because when Barnabans would lose something, they would try to find solutions to be mixed in so that they could continue to have as holistic and integrated a culture as possible. So in my book, I, I wrote a book called Consuming Ocean Island Stories of People and Phosphate from Banaba. And I gave an example of different kinds of colonial ordinances that were um, that I found listed in the archives. And in these ordinances, they would say things like, you are not allowed to sing and dance from this time to this time. And these times would get bigger and bigger to the point when, when was there time for singing and dancing ever based on what you could and couldn't do between, you know, 7 a.m. and 6 p.m. So they would constantly come up with these rules to push out things that people would have been doing as a normal part of their everyday practice and as part of their way of being human and full of life and celebrating um, their own knowledges, their own histories, their own languages. And so I was staring at these policies thinking somebody doing similar research might think, oh, well, you know, they were just making sure people were highly productive and contributing to the economy and making sure they weren't singing and dancing foolishly all day. But in fact, those songs and those dances and those opportunities for gathering socially and culturally were those moments where you could maintain 
who you are as as a community, as a family, as a village, as a clan. Um, and so I could see very clearly that it wasn't just the land and the environment that was being gutted. It was actually the social fabric. It was forms of cultural and creative expression, um, having time in your day for weaving, having time in your day for singing and teaching the next generation your songs and your dances, which were archives of history. So songs, dances, costumes, can building canoes, all of these things are our archives, are the archives of oral and embodied cultures. And when they removed or limited the time for doing that sort of thing so that everyone could be consumers or everyone could go and get fish to, to, you know, to trade and feed the colonial administration and the laborers and the workers um, so they could be in school learning about learning the Bible and, and learning Gilbertese, which wasn't their language. When you changed pe what people were doing with their time, you were also making these big holes in their culture. So when Bonneville started to realize, oh, they're losing bits and pieces, like things, things started to get lost because it was an 80 year period of mining. That's eight decades. So it's a couple of um, generations they would bring in um, forms of expression, songs, um, chants, those sorts of things from the Tuvaluans or the Gilbertese or the Fijians, uh, from the, the British, from whatever other culture was now living and working on the island, including Japanese, Chinese. Like at one point you had like five or six different cultures speaking different languages, all living in six square kilometers. And so there was a lot of remixing going on socially and culturally, even though the British were quite segregationist and tried to keep everyone separate as much as they could. But um, because it was a quite a vibrant labor intensive industry with so many different kinds of workers and and it wasn't just you know like the British it would be Australia New Zealand French all you know all kinds of people all living there at the same time um a lot of remixing started to happen on the island and that continued as kind of a social and cultural creative strategy for Bonobans as they moved to Fiji and then started to try to figure out who they were amongst Itauke Fijians, uh, Rotumans, Indo-Fijians, you know, Chinese, lots of other different Europeans, other cultures that lived in Fiji. So I became very fascinated with this idea of remix, which for me was something better than the concept of hybridity that had this very sort of genetic, <laughs> you know, kind of implications to it. Remix for me seems something you do. You yeah. can you can mix things together. Actually, I was just thinking as you were talking then that, um, that in a way, I mean, New Zealand's entire wealth is dependent on the application of superphosphate. And yes. that the that the, um, the the rock and the dust that it was turned into, I mean, uh, is 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 a is a kind of a terrible metaphor for dispersion of Bonavin culture, life, spirituality on our on our fields and countryside. And uh, it, it, I'd love to be able to kind of have a group of Bonavins coming to talk to farmers and saying, "Do you know us through <laughs> through the phosphate that's." Uh, been productive on your land uh, I, and I did that I actually did that I went to farms in Australia and New Zealand I I, I went to the um South Island where um but phosphate was everywhere absolutely everywhere across yeah. across New Zealand North and South Island but I had conversations with farmers and people would gather you know in someone's living room and we'd talk about soil we talk about you know, wheat and grain and, and what, what sheep and cows were eating. And we talked about the difference between 
um, fields that had no superphosphate and fields that had superphosphate. And I even took to Maori owned farms where their families had been farming for generations as well. And we we talked about this this very unfortunate idea of consumption and of consuming our Pacific islands where our ancestors had been buried for thousands of years. And a lot of um, you know, Maori found this absolutely um awful, um, but also absolutely admitted to the fact that you cannot now take out all of these bits of rock from Banaba and also Nauru as well, which was mined at the same time that is now flowing through um, the New Zealand landscape that's now flowing across Victoria, South Australia, Western Australia, New South Wales um, as well. And how that in terms of relationality that sets up a very real, very organic, um, but also very awkward and difficult kind of um, kinship between Bunnabans and um, these two landscapes that basically consumed our island. Um, it's it's a difficult, but also a very interesting kind of trans-Indigenous conversation to have. And you already mentioned climate change and the link between what happened in Banaba and, and climate change. So what does the Banaba experience tell us about the current situation with regard to relocation and displacement induced by, by climate change? On the one hand, there's a lot of talk of loss of culture and so forth. But on the other hand, you also talk about the remixing and uh, engaging in conversations with people from a different cultural background. Uh, so how, how would your assessment be of the current displacement relocation discourse linked to climate change? Yeah, interestingly, I think about it actually mainly from a policy perspective, because I'm finding a lot of current research, policy and discussions about future current and future displacement from climate change to very rarely refer to previous forms of environmental displacement that already exist in the Pacific. I'm finding everyone's historical amnesia or strategic, you know, erasure of all memories of all islanders who've already been moved around very problematic. So, so my first response is, is from this policy kind of perspective where people working in the climate space, both islanders and non-islanders, are not that interested in populations that have already been moved around the Pacific because of um, things that have happened to their environments like mining. So I, I'm finding that quite poor, a poor methodology, like a poor approach to creating um, policy and planning for current and future displacement. If you if you don't understand what happened to Banabans and why they were moved, if you don't understand what happened to the Gilbertes in Kiribati who were moved to the Solomon Islands, if you don't understand why Tuvaluans, one group of Tuvaluans moved to Kioa in Fiji, if you don't understand why, you know, uh, why people were moved because of nuclear testing, then you shouldn't be working on um, plans and policies for the move of anyone due to climate change. Because clim climate change, people talk about it like some sort of new thing, like it's some sort of recent new phenomenon that they now have to think of and they can forget the impact of industrialization going back, you know, millennia and forget the impacts of colonialism going back millennia and, and any other forms of extraction and empire. For me, that is not great policy work. That is not great research um, because the details of what happened to displaced communities, already displaced communities, and what happened in terms of how they fared in their new environments, for me, are absolutely critical to doing better 
better work around current and future displacement. And, you know, things like displace, displacement because of war and other conflicts as well are all relevant there. So, for example, World War II came to Banaba because of phosphate because Japan was a buyer of the phosphate. Japanese had worked in the phosphate mines right from the beginning. Japan was a stakeholder in that mine and in all forms of superphosphate consumption. So something like mining and extraction already creates the geopolitics and the economics that then have an industry that creates the environment that causes the climate change that then results in policies and processes and procedures being needed to uh, make made for future displacement like so for me it's all quite structural like the relationships between all of these different things are quite structural and they repeat over time like these forms of extraction and displacement repeat over time and so you can't think of something as something new that requires new thinking if you don't understand the past, if you don't understand history, if you don't know where all of these things, these events, these the, the causes of the problems that we have today, if you don't understand where they come from. So that's for me how something like understanding displacement due to mining which people might say, oh, that's very different from climate displacement. It's not like rising sea levels. And I'm like, well, that's just poor way of understanding all phenomena because you have to take a multi-scaler and a, and a you know, multi-temporal, you have to think across time and space and place and you have to structurally link all of these events that have caused a lot of the different damage and then your solutions need to be as complex as the events and the decisions that created your predicament in the first place so i do want people working in the climate change space on whatever aspect including things like loss and damage which for me is crazy because there's been loss and damage going back across millennia you know, to, to talk about new loss and damage is quite bizarre to me. Um, I want all of those uh, people working on solutions to have a better historical context and a better historical grounding for their knowledge base and their, um, their approaches to coming up with um, solutions. Um, and, you know, even in a place like Fiji, you move somebody who's been down at the coast and their ancestors have been at the coast for, for hundreds of years and you move them, you know, a hundred meters up a mountain, you're absolutely impacting their culture, especially if it's not by choice, you know, moving by choice and knowing you can go back to your ancestral land, that's different from being forced and being taken wholesale from from a place in a space that's created who you are as a people for so, you know, so many, many, many years and so many generations. And that's sort of the way I've been thinking about, you know, what's happened to Bonobans. I try to think about it in deep time, not just what happened since, since 1900. Mm -hmm. As a historian, I, I like it that you want uh, that you try to give historical depth to the current climate change uh, discourse. And you also have said um, that uh, climate change or the climate emergency is just another stage of colonialism. And can you elaborate a little bit on that, the colonialism uh, dimension of, of, of climate change? Yeah, I think for me, it's it's structural again. You know, some people think there's like, like colonialism only happens when a flag is planted and then somebody gains independence. And then as soon as you gain independence and take over a government, you are no longer under a colonial, you know, in a, in a situation of colonialism. Whereas if you think about it more structurally in terms of power and in terms of, 
what is required for colonialism to be effective? It's not just about politics or government or, um, you know, who's, who's, who's the boss and who's not the boss. It's, it's a much more sophisticated, complicated kind of phenomenon, which requires people to convert spiritually for example they have to change their religion they have to change their language they have to change all forms of education they have to change their economics they have to think about land and property in different ways everyone's taxed what is this tax what does it mean like there are so many different systems that have to change because of colonialism that i don't think you suddenly gain independence and freedom when that flag has been removed and there's a new flag in place and you've got your own flag. For me, colonialism is an ongoing um, kind of thing, a little bit like empire. The faces of empire change, but the forces and um, who ends up being in charge, whether it's uh, you know, systems of patriarchy or systems that have come out of Christian, you know, traditions and values or so-called values, you know, these sorts of things don't really change just because there's a different prime minister or different president um, in place. So because I think of colonialism as something that doesn't really have an ending, um, I can see that, uh, climate change as well is something that has absolutely come out of colonial history. Uh, climate change is not possible without colonialism and, and, and the expansion of empire, which is predicated on resource extraction and of siphoning off the wealth and resources of one part of the world for a different part of the world. You know, it's, it's about what's happened all across the global south uh, because of what is now the global north. Um, so, so yeah, for me, you have to understand colonialism and empire in order to study climate change. And I think one of the things that makes this a bit tricky is people often think of climate change as um, requiring more of a scientific basis of knowledge so in order to understand climate change you need to understand the science behind it all and often science is kept quite separate from the humanities and the social sciences so that means if you're not taking an interdisciplinary or a transdisciplinary approach it's very easy to just see something like climate change as a technical thing that requires technical solutions don't need history don't need knowledge of culture don't need knowledge of society or storytelling or spirituality or anything else whereas if you approach things much more holistically which is the way I understand the impacts of colonialism as well, you can see how all of these things are entangled with each other and how you can't categorize and separate them out and only study one corner of it and think that you can see the whole. And I think the, the fact that climate change impacts the whole planet, meaning there's no corner left spared, means you have to understand all phenomena across the planet. Maybe not thoroughly, but you have to have a really good interdisciplinary holistic sense of everything that's going on, whether it's social, cultural, spiritual, psychological, environmental, everything that all the different species are experiencing, you have to think of mountains and rivers and valleys and waterways and oceans. You have to have that, that sense of that complexity and then your methods have to at least account for that complexity as well in order to even begin to think about, you know, what we do now in terms of solutions. But at the moment, a lot of the solutions are quite technical and they're also sort of about progress in the future you know it's sort of like well maybe we could find another planet or you know I don't know what they're thinking but if you understand colonial history you'll know don't go colonizing another planet that's a bad idea right <laughs> so you need to understand how colonialism and empire worked in the past 
before making some really silly decisions about creating rockets to another, you know, planet and solar system. And for me, that's why, you know, this, this understanding that there's no end yet to how humans think they can dominate different environments, different landscapes, different cultures. Um, that's what's caused climate change, not some magical thing from the sky. It is what so, humans have done. In, so, so in terms of your own analysis, it's clear that you, you're wanting to do a kind of a systems analysis. You're wanting to do an analysis that, in, in a sense, is post-colonial in all its different forms. Or neo-colonial. <laughs> or neo-colonial. Neo but, but one of the challenges, you know, as Franz Fanon reminded us, is that um, the decolonization of the mind is probably the hardest of all. So in, in terms of all of your research and um, and experience there, I mean, how you know, how do you think, you know, um, we can really begin that sort of internal um, exploration um, of our own minds and other people's minds so that the colonial presence um, um, becomes a, a, a negated force? I, I don't actually think uh, full decolonization is possible. And um, I have a project. Uh, I started a project uh, with some colleagues um, uh, and HDR students in uh, the School of Culture, History and Language, which we decided to call decolonial possibilities <laughs> and not decolonization of anything. It's the idea of the possibilities, but not thinking that anyone is ever going to get rid, you know, of some of that colonial thinking, those values, those uh, ways of knowing and being in the world, because I think we are all part of that system. Now we are all not, not a hundred percent. I would say there are definitely people in different corners of the world who have resisted as much as they could, um, and you literally need to be out of all, you know, all commodity chains and, and everything else. But I don't think a full decolonization of the mind is possible. And I think we should be realistic about that. It's about the possibilities. It's about hope. It's about the imagination. It's about actually putting real alternatives and considering those real alternatives, even if you know, it means we don't have mobile phones anymore, which, you know, like nobody's wanting to give up at the moment. But it's it's this idea of actually opening up scope for imagining different ways. And they might they might be old ways. They might be new ways. They might be integrated ways. They might be future ways. But um, I don't believe that it is possible to fully decolonize the mind. For me, it's not really about... Uh, good ancestors and bad ancestors or, or or evacuating you know all systems of thought that have been colonizing i i don't think it's black and white and i don't think it's binary i don't think it's you know good versus evil that sort of thing i think it's complex and i think there's good and bad and complicated in all genealogies throughout all cultures but it is very clear which societies and states and cultures and countries have been dominating the planet, who actually hold the power and who are controlling things and causing a lot of the problems and the conflicts and the wars and the extraction right now. And I do think those states and those countries have to be accountable and held responsible for what they are doing. So I don't think there's equality amongst all humans in terms of our impacts on the planet. I think people need to be held accountable and histories and communities and cultures need to be held um, accountable, but I don't think it's possible to fully um, decolonize. And I think acceptance then is part of reimagining the possibilities, not thinking you can somehow be pure and free of all of those bad things. Well, another way of, re of putting that possibly in terms of reframing it a little is to sort of argue that uh, none of us will be free until we have responded to dominatory politics at whatever level they, they take place. Absolutely. I mean, so your, your post-colonial possibility has to do with, you know, what, what, are your, um, what are your means of resistance to dominatory 
politics. Yeah, absolutely, That's absolutely. So, so what does this mean for research, teaching, education? So what has to change in this regard and what are you doing in your, your position? You already mentioned trans transdisciplinarity, for instance. Yes, yes. So um, I was one of those students, probably at every level of, you know, primary school, secondary school, undergrad, master's, and even my PhD, who didn't quite, I mean, I understood what most of my teachers were saying, but I basically didn't agree with a lot of the ways in which I was being taught in all of these different classrooms and, and contexts. And now that might have had to do with, you know, other things like levels of anxiety or or what have you. But I ne it was rare for me to find a system of learning that fully gave you a critical toolbox for thinking that you could then take in the world and and apply in transformative and interesting ways. And so throughout most of my education, I'd, I'd either be I did okay, but I was often lost. I often didn't understand a lot of things. And I often thought we needed to be way more creative um, in most of my classrooms. And that was outside um, schools of art. <laughs> like it was like outside creative context. I wanted social sciences and humanities to be a lot more creative. I wanted other forms of knowledge production in these spaces that were mainly about reading and writing and texts. So I would say this to my professors and some of them, you know, would just say, you know, you still have to write a 3000 word essay. You know, that's very nice <laughs> what you're thinking and saying. But, you know, at the end of the day, you need to be able to write an excellent essay. And they they wouldn't allow me to do what I wanted to do, which was maybe to do like a graphic novel or like to do a big drawing about some complex issue in the Pacific and hand in my assignments in ways that were not linear and that were not textual. So I started to integrate visual, choreographic, embodied, other forms of, um, you know, research and knowledge production for at the master's level, but then really started to do more of that at the PhD level. And I produced a thesis, which was, was, had the word um, visualizing and dancing in the title while talking about phosphate mining. So you can imagine what that looked like. Um, but I was just always experimenting and really building upon Pacific forms of knowledge production in the academy to see what different methods and what different approaches and what different forms of knowledge could come out of that was that were not like in the discipline of theater or discipline of dance, but actually in the spaces between disciplines. Um, so, you know, I was always building a, a sort of my own archive that was visual, that was choreographic. You know, I had thousands of photographs, I had moving images. I had drawings because I was always drawing. I had all of these different ways in which I was documenting my research process. And then even though we were encouraged just to publish journal articles, write book chapters, write monographs or books, I was trying to figure out, you know, 20 years ago, I was trying to figure out if there was other ways in which I could share my research that wasn't so traditional and wasn't so linear. Um, and eventually I, um, a few years ago, I worked with um, an artist and a curator, Yuki Kihara, to come up with um, a way of sharing my research, which was through a multimedia installation, which would exist in a particular space that was open to the public. So I basically started doing exhibitions And this was like a culmination of all the different things I'd been thinking about as a teacher and as a researcher, um, ways of learning that I wanted to be able to express myself and ways that I was encouraging my students to learn and express their knowledge in my classes um, as well. And so 
all of those things kind of fed into um, what was for me a much more integrated, multimedia, holistic way of presenting knowledge about something that was quite complex and quite, um, you know, historical, something like mining, rather than writing 2000 words on mining, I put together a multimedia installation. And, you know, I had been empowering my students for years to kind of express their ideas and express their learning and their research and proje projects through different forms of assessment that would allow them to do exactly that kind of thing. So I've had students who made films. I had students who created a climate change board game <laughs> as one of their forms of assessment because I said, go big, think about how you want to present about climate change, what would you do? And they came up with this like game of life under conditions of climate change. And you, you had to, if you were going to migrate from one place to another, it was like moving, you know, along this, um, along this board, but then you'd come up with barriers and boundaries like Australia's, you know, climate policies, et cetera. So I, I have always been trying to do things in a more, creative way but not just for the sake of creativity more as a way of being able to bring into a classroom or into the research pro process um more complex and more multi-dimensional ways of understanding something without fully going down the technical road so I'm not interested in gaming <laughs> I'm not interested in creating you know virtual realities I'm I'm a bit more old school I want people to use materials you know I want people to to sew or to draw or to paint or to put a photo collage together and then to explain to me how that opens up our our ways of thinking to approach things in more complex nuance but also poignant ways more poignant and impactful ways because one of my goals in my classroom for example is for students to be transformed to become better global citizens to go out into the world and make better decisions and do things better for everyone so they have to have some kind of you know, transformation within their hearts as much as transformation within their minds. So for me, different forms of assessment, different assignments, you know, different ways of writing, being more poetic, hopefully does some of that transformative work because one of the goals of my Banaban research has always been um, repair, restoration, healing, transformation but also justice to have like a good sort of sense of justice so that you know you don't just say oh dear we trash that island oh, let's move on to the next island and maybe we'll do better then no there's all of these places and peoples and communities that have been damaged that deserve justice that deserve restoration and healing repair you don't just throw things in the rubbish and and keep moving so those are kind of the broader goals and values that are in my my classrooms and in my own research and work. And it kind of combines methods and tools for critical thinking together with sense of justice, transformation, becoming better citizens, and you know, doing work that's that's a bit more impactful and travels beyond the boundaries of the academy as well. So um, my current multimedia um, project, which has now been going for a few years, which kind of brings all of these elements of my research together and and goes from site to site, kind of telling this Barnabin story in in what seems like new locations, but are actually the routes in which our land took, you know, from from Banaba to Australia to New Zealand to Hawaii, to Fiji, to Japan, to all of these locations. I My work travels from site to site, telling this story in these multidimensional ways and kind of inviting people to have conversations about that and what that means 
in terms of their own stories and their own histories and their own lives. So that is the way I do things in pretty much every context. <laughs> um, Very good. I, I, yes, I, I really, forward. <laughs> really appreciate your renaissance approach to these things. And I think it's really great that um, you, you are an academic that's willing to be experimental in relation to art and, <laughs> yes. activity and, and assessment and so forth. Coming back to Banaba at the end of the, this conversation, I mean, what's the current situation on the island? Uh, what are the dangers ahead? And is there hope for a better future? And and is there any way in which um, remixing, reintegrating, bringing the pieces together again will result in um, some transformation of that rock that you knew as home? Absolutely. Um, I hope so. Um, recently we had, um, and it's been in the media, so we had a, a Australian mining company who was interested in mining again on Barnaba and that was quite triggering. And what was very concerning was our, our people became divided almost immediately, pro-mining and anti-mining. Um, so, you know, Pacific people, they're quite diverse and everyone has different ideas about you know, how to develop economically and support their needs. But it I quickly realized that I need to be sharing, you know, my knowledge and research a lot more broadly. And I've been working for many years with um, community organizers, families, and other Banabans on the ground who have similar ideas to me about safeguarding Banaba, about repair repairing, restoring, and rehabilitating Banaba. And so we're constantly having to talk to those who want to remine Banaba. And this is a, you know, back and forth, quite intense periods within the Banaban community. But my hope is that along with environmental repair, which is very possible with six square kilometers, especially if Australia, New Zealand, Great Britain, Japan, and everyone else who took a piece of Banaba just put their minds together and contribute, you know, a little bit of support to that restoration and repair. That is possible. I don't believe you should fill in all the holes of Banaba. So a lot of people have this idea of rehabilitation as, well, there's big holes and there's pinnacles. So we should just pour some soil and pour some more land or rocks into those holes and bring back up the surface. I actually think when you damage and devastate a landscape, there should be some repair, but then there should also be reminders. There should be reminders, um, monuments and things like that so that we don't make those same mistakes again. So I want kind of a... Um, a sense of repair and restoration, you know, environmentally, physically, socially, and spiritually on Banaba, and for people to have access to Banaba to visit and to learn. You know, I dream of world heritage on, on Banaba. It's a heritage of agriculture, of mining, of industry, of so many things. Um, and I'm hoping that, you know, people will see that that's that's um, something quite innovative and interesting that would be much better than actually remining and squeezing dry the very last drop of phosphoric acid that they can get out of that landscape, which is currently the proposal in front of some of our leaders. I want them to take a different route and to see the possibilities of collaboration, repair, restoration, and healing. And there are quite a few of us, um, Banabans and others, who are committed to that and have been working together, brainstorming and thinking together about this um, for some time. So that's my kind of hope and vision for the future. And I think it's so relevant, not just for Banaba, but for many devastated places and landscapes and communities across the world. So I always think Banaba can teach all of us so much. I'm very impressed that, you know, you've you managed to combine sort of academia with this desire for transformation. There's sort of far too little transformation in the academy. Um, <laughs> so it's, I, th I think it's a breath of fresh air to have somebody like you combining poetry and art and dance and music and all those other things which are indeed the kind of healing balm for this kind of sorry world that we're in at the moment.
absolutely so more dance and music and healing and far less of all the devastation and the bombing and the wars everywhere yeah. and yes we can do it we really can but we need to yeah maybe get some better leaders in place <laughs> Absolutely, but I, I want to add my thanks to Volker as well, um, and, to, and to you particularly for, you know, such an informative and, and lovely conversation.